Hello, today is March 9th, 2022. I want to welcome you into this space. This is our Coaching and Context webinar hosted by Fielding Graduate University. My name is Dr. Carrie Arnold, and I am the Director of Evidence-Based Coaching here at the university. <clears throat> we um, have monthly webinars that we provide to the coaching community, and I'm very excited to present and introduce our speaker for today. A couple of announcements first. Please make sure you stay on mute. And this session is eligible for ICF education units. You need to stay for the entire live session and complete an evaluation at the end. As we near the end of the session, I will put the evaluation link in chat. And you'll just wanna complete that in the next 24 to 48 hours. This is being recorded and will be made available to everybody who registered. We had 127 people total who registered. So we will make sure everyone has access to this and we will send it out by email just in case you need to leave early. We will also be posting a link to a session we're hosting next week. So on March 16th, we're doing another coaching and context webinar on the shadow systems of coaching. So I'll Throughout the session, I'll, I'll add a reminder in there as well. So let me introduce to you our speaker. I'm very excited to introduce Claire. I've heard her speak before, and I just learned so much that I invited her in to uh, be one of our monthly webinars. And so Claire has been an executive coach and facilitator for over 30 years. She's worked with the most senior levels of corporate life. Uh, she has... Uh, also become a coaching supervisor for others. So those of you who are interested or know about coaching supervision, Claire operates in that space. She's authored a couple different books, The Challenger Spirit back in 2011, and 100 Mindsets of Challenger Leaders in 2014. She was external coach of the year in 2017. And she's one of the most influential HR thinkers. And that was named in 2013 by HR Review Magazine. She is the founder of Mindful Life Charity. Uh, it provides emotional support and resilience training. She is joining us from the UK. She's about three and a half hours from London in the West Country in Devon. And Claire, thank you for being here. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. That's so kind. Thank you so much. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Really lovely to, to see either you on the screen or to see your pictures. Um, we're going to take a short, um, reflective but practical journey into um, the practice of mindfulness, trying to shift our awareness away from uh, mindfulness as a self-care activity exclusively towards what you might describe as a pro-social practice. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean about that as I go along. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you in a minute, so uh, there'll be um, stuff for you to look at. I don't have a lot of slides, and they will, I think, probably carry. Will they be available to people? They will. Um, so you can have those as a background reference. If you have questions um, that arise during the course of my speaking and your thinking, then if you could just post them on the chat box. And what Carrie will do is uh, interrupt me. I've given her permission to interrupt me at any moment with anything that she thinks uh, may be pertinent. And so that we'll try and uh, get through this, um, the discourse of this with conversation as we go along. Um, I, I should also declare uh, that I'm a, a, a Zen uh, Buddhist, and um, I think that has some impact on on my both on my mindfulness practice and on my um, on my way of thinking about my work with my clients. Um, what I also want to say to you is there isn't a question here that's silly, so um, it's impossible for you to get this wrong. It's absolutely impossible for you to get this wrong. It's impossible for you to ask a wrong question. And when we get into the practice arena, um, where I'm gonna be asking you to do some things reflectively with me, it's also impossible for you to get it wrong. There is only the possibility of either ignoring the data or discovering something. So there's only the possibility of ignoring the data or discovering something. And um, so I think we should get started. I'll share my screen anyway, let's see how this goes. Okay, I think you might be able to see that. And um, let's move us, uh, oh, let's move us in. You see, this is where the thing screws. Okay, here we go. 
Now, um, the thing I really wanted to say first about this is, is this idea of kind of expanding, expanding the way we think about mindfulness um, uh, and, and coming at this practice as a coach um, in a number of different ways. So obviously I've already mentioned self-care and I, I think that it's quite common for people to use a mindfulness-based practice to down-regulate their mental, emotional or physical continuum. And you and I know that the people that we're working with are going to be hyper-regulated quite a lot of the time based on the speed and pace and agility and demands of the workplace or wherever you happen to encounter those people. So self-care is a very valid form of um, regulation, centering and grounding for ourselves and also for our clients. But it's not necessarily the only way or the only reason that we use it. I think when we learn to use mindfulness as a, a place of resting in presence, learning to use mindfulness as a place of resting in presence, that we actually get to um, bypass and begin to expand um, our relationship with our own inner editor. And what I mean by that is, is that um, we often sit with clients who have a very strong inner editor, things they should think and shouldn't think, things they should be interpreting and not interpreting, experiencing and not experiencing. And we in our profession also have an inner editor associated with the way in which we've been taught to coach. This is good coaching. This is not good coaching. This is an appropriate intervention here. This one feels like it's more coming from my agenda. I'm not saying these things are wrong, but what I do notice is that over time, if we don't pay intentional attention to our inner editor, these states of mind, these habitual responses, these well-formed views about the way the world is and how we describe our experience become a sort of truth because we're kind of bound by that and we don't see what's outside it. And so we're using mindfulness practice in coaching here for ourselves and for our clients as a way of beginning to open up that internal editing response, which becomes so habitual that it almost dominates the landscape, either in our clients or in ourself. And later, um, not too, not too later, I'm going to show you some work by Greg Kramer in this in this domain, which I think we could play with and would illustrate the point. Some of you may be aware of a woman called um, Nora Bateson. Uh, she's the daughter of uh, Gregory Bateson, and she talks a lot about this idea of warm data. And I think that um, in a world where logic dominates um, and this desire for things to have a rational purpose, an outcome, almost like what I would describe as a commodity mind, um, mindfulness practice actually gives us access to our own warm data as a valid source of experience, as a valid source of experience. So I know when I work in certain industries in the world, um, people talk about how pragmatic they are and how data driven they are. And they, they fail to see that they're leading through their own experience of the world and their own psychology and their own mindsets, which are not as hard and fast and cold data driven as they think they are. They're actually leading from warm data. So we ought to really take that into account. And when I supervise coaches, when I ask them to reflect on the energetic experience or the metaphor experience they're having with their clients, they bring a large amount of warm data to that reflection which if they had access to it in the room while they were working with their clients, they probably would have a wider base of awareness and potentially tools and interventions to bring to the conversation. So understanding our own inner editor, um, developing an attention, an intentional attention to our own warm data simply widens our base of tools and interventions and awareness so that we can bring more to the party and more to the party may mean less speaking. It may mean something else. It doesn't have to be a fulsome intervention. 
we often use questioning, catalytic questioning in coaching as a way of revealing uh, to our clients what's under the surface. I think it's absolutely possible to use mindfulness practice in the same way. Um, those of you that may be familiar with uh, Gendlin's work on focusing, um, I don't know, Carrie, is that, is that part of the program that people do with you in any way, shape or form? Say that name one more time, Claire. Jean, Jean Gendlin's work on focusing. I don't think so. I'll have to look into that. OK, please do, because um, I think Gendlin, um, he, he produced a book called Focusing. They did a really interesting piece of research. Um, uh, I can't exactly remember the, the time of it, but let's say it was in the late 80s. Um, and you can find this in, in the book. But and they, they do some training on focusing. It, if you like, it was a precursor in, in many respects to, to our focus now on mindfulness. The importance, though, in this research was they were looking at what made the most effective one-to-one -one outcomes in relationships, therapeutic or in mainly counselling relationships. This is sort of pre the coaching industry. And they had two working assumptions. And one was that it was the rapport so between the two people, the rapport or the quality of the relationship increased the efficacy of the result. And the second thing they thought was that um, it, it may be down to a particular methodology being more effective than others. And they did plenty of research into these practices. And what they concluded at the end of it was that it was neither of those things. And, and this is of profound importance to the world of coaching, but very rarely discussed, that what seemed to be the most important differentiator in in the um, results that clients were experiencing the progress that clients felt they were making and the um the evaluation that they could give to the alteration in their experiences and what they were trying to cause was based on one thing and one thing only and that was their internal ability to track and process somatically and emotionally and cognitively the learning process and the unbinding process as they were going through the one-to-one -one work. In other words, those clients who were able to literally notice what was happening in their mental, emotional and physical continuum as the conversation was unfolding, accelerated their learning and therefore accelerated and integrated their change faster than those that couldn't. And to me, that's mindfulness by any other name. So this revelation, revealing what's under the surface, um, warm data, expanding beyond our inner editor is fundamentally um, a practice that we can really help our clients engage with way beyond self-care. So we want clients to feel de-stressed and to have a sense of regulation and to be less reactive so that they can respond. But if we're stopping the practice of mindfulness at that point, we are missing an ability to increase our own learning agility and the learning agility of our clients by really encouraging them to have mindful, intentional attention on themselves and on the conversation as it's unfolding. And this does not have to be done in a spiritual way. This is a context that you can bring around learning agility efficacy of results and around this idea of um, uh, uh, in tuning in or what we would describe as interception, this, this ability to intercept, to notice what's happening in the mental, emotional and um, physical continuum. The other thing I think um, that this allows for is the finding of new ways to express old problems the finding of new ways to express old problems, the, the, um, the releasing of uh, constraints around how we define or describe problems or our experience of ourselves in situations, moving into new forms of expression. Um, because if mindfulness is anything, it's a practice of curiosity. If mindfulness is anything, it's a practice of curiosity. And the reason I would describe it as a pro-social practice is because we're, we now completely understand that the more you as a coach or our clients are able to practice this skill of interception, this skill of noticing 
what's going on on the inside while they're conversing and working with you, they are directly impacting the resonant circuits in their brain. Literally, they are creating uh, um, increased fibers across three parts of the brain we now term as the resonant circuit, which actually increases empathy. So we don't have to work at learning the theory of empathy. We have to learn to be empathic with our own bodies. We have to learn to be empathic with the shifts and changes in our own warm data as we're engaging in coaching in order over a short period of time to increase our resonance and empathy or empathic response with others. And so to me, the reason this is a pro-social practice, not just a self-care practice, is because the effect of this kind of interception is to increase our ability to relate to others and our ability to be in community with others. And we don't have to pause very long, do we, to think about what's going on in the world right now, to know that some of those resonant circuits are profoundly absent, profoundly absent in the way in which the world is unfolding. There are plenty of vows in Zen, um, uh, but the three that have been the most useful to me in my coaching practice in this domain of interception or mindfulness are these three here. And, and I want to talk about them um, uh, in, in two ways, really, for you. Uh, so we'll start with the first one. The sequence of these I also think is important. Um, over the years since I've been practicing, it, it's come to um, my attention really through plenty of mistakes that the sequence of these, one gives rise to the other, gives rise to the other. They are sort of nested inside each other. So this vow of not knowing. First of all, um, the word vow in our context really means an intention to try, an intention to experience, an intention to, to, to move towards. So to, to have an intention to not know. Now, that seems almost paradoxical, particularly if you spent a lot of time educating yourself as a coach and getting your accreditations, that part of the process here is to be able to acquire knowledge and acquire skills in order to be able to be of hyper value to your clients. And here I come along from the southwest of England saying what's really helpful in our coaching practice is a vow of not knowing. And what I really mean by that is the vow, the intention to not come at everything as if you know it. In, in Zen, we describe it as begin again mind, having a begin again mind. It's a very, very liberating practice, and it's very, very helpful in your own mindfulness practice. You see, without the vow or the intention to not know, we assume so quickly, so fast and so widely about all sorts of dynamics, narratives, stories, um, uh, uh, relationships between the story or the parts or who is sitting in front of us. And even if we say we start again, often we have this internal register that we can just tick box through, tick, tick, tick. OK, it's like this. So this is a deep practice of curiosity. Mindfulness is a deep, a deep practice of curiosity, curiosity about what's happening inside you now and then now and then now with the aim of liberating more creativity, reducing the inner editor, um, bringing you in touch with the flow of your own agility and your own mental, emotional agility and liberating new possibility both inside your own mental and emotional continuum and that of your clients. So this vow of not knowing is, a, is, a, is just a deep practice of curiosity. We can't really talk about not knowing too much in the coaching world because we're, we're, we're pulled between um, the, the, the need to become accomplished 
and 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 to be able to do things in a right and ethical way and in a value based way um, and this and this need to keep learning. But but we don't don't confuse learning with not knowing. Because learning can often simply be the acquisition of things that you make fit into something you already believe. The vow of not knowing is a willingness to be altered. It's a willingness to be altered. And frequently when clients sit in front of me these days and I'm going through the contracting process with them, um, part of my contracting process is really around who shows up in the room. Who shows up in the room? How do we show up in the room in this inquiry of being willing to be altered, not knowing? The vow of bearing witness, um, I think, is super, super helpful in our work in a systemic sense. Uh, so we, we, the vow of bearing witness here means that we're, we're looking to really investigate and really sit in the shoes of or the somatic experience of uh, the parts of the story or the parts of the person or the parts of the system that they're describing so that we're bringing intelligence to our conversation from many different places. Um, and it seems impossible to do that second vow if you haven't really made an, a good practice out of vow one. You know, this idea that we, uh, we come from a place of curiosity and because of that curiosity, we're willing to stand in the places and parts of the story, the narrative, the goals, the aspiration or the context, which we would normally ignore or we don't feel we have affinity with or we don't really want to invest the time in. And increasingly, the stories that clients are bringing to us are going to have more and more systemic complexity associated with them. And we as coaches have to be able to understand that people are living, they are nested inside a system. So they are, their issues are arising from a systemic state. It is no longer enough to simply view the person as a single self-directed entity. They, they are figural to you, but they are arising from a system and a constellation of issues and dynamics. And so your capacity to be able to help the client move around the system in, in orchestrating what it is they want to change comes from this deep curiosity. And we have to, when we're practicing mindfulness, learn to bear witness to ourselves. When you're sitting with clients, you need to learn to be able to bear witness simultaneously to what is occurring in you and have attention on the other. The skill of being able to intercept and relate simultaneously gets easier over time when we realize that we're not just mindfully sitting for our self-care, but we're sitting in a mindful presence with the other to increase the empathic resonance to increase the field of our awareness and to increase our systemic understanding of all the elements from the edge that might need to come into play in the conversations that we're having. And finally, this, this notion of compassionate action, it's interesting, isn't it? It comes third, it comes third. It arises out of a deep practice of curiosity the willingness to stand in the shoes, deeply empathically in the shoes of the other or the multiple others. And only then can we discern what is compassionate or kind or useful or awakening to do with our clients. So it, uh, that kind of um, state of care and compassion uh, in, in this model is directly arising once you have been deeply curious is arising once you have been able to bear witness to your own feelings about a situation and another's, your own cognition and another's, and what else is coming from the edge. So that a compassionate response is, is arising as a result of that data. I return to these um, practices over and over again every day. I catch myself falling down all the time. I just do it with humor these days. As I said to you, I think it's impossible to get it wrong. Um, 
we can celebrate more when we get it right. So to me, this idea of coming to our own mental, emotional and physical continuums and those of our clients with an aim of being in a whole body conversation in our coaching is the practice for today. It may not have been the practice 30 or 40 years ago. I was one of the first executive coaches in this country, um, in the first coaching house in the UK. I was one of those coaches that was involved in the development of the GROW model. We were practicing on McKinsey and Bain partners. Uh, we had a very, very clear intention to work with the human being, the performance of one human being. Uh, but that was nearly 30, 40 years ago. And, um, and that methodology uh, needs some shifting and some attention because the world is much more rapidly complex and connected than it was at that time. So our coaching, even though it's focused on the person, unless you do team coaching, focused on the person or the people, needs still this awareness of the system. And we as coaches are part of the system. This picture um, is a, this is an enormous piece of granite that sits outside a church on Trafalgar Square in London, maybe a, a place you've heard of, uh, Nelson's Column, big central square in London. And um, the piece of granite is probably, probably somewhere in the region of about five feet tall and probably about four feet wide. And um, the sculptor um, produced uh, this piece of art and you can see that the body is arising out of the, the rock. It's arising out of the rock. The, sculpt, the sculpting of the body has not been placed on the rock. It's arisen out of the rock. And in a way, um, this phrase, know the form in order to be formless, uh, comes from Tai Chi, as I understand it. I had a, a student who taught me some Tai Chi and she used to say to me, the thing I love about Tai Chi is that you learn the form, you learn the form in order to become formless. And so I think what happens here is that what we're trying, what I'm trying to express here is that our mindfulness practice, we learn forms of mindfulness. You know, we, we follow the breath, uh, we pay attention to stillness, we pay attention to movement. It becomes, if you like, a goal in and of itself. And I'm suggesting to you that it goes way beyond that. It goes way beyond itself into the capacity for us um, in coaching to use mindfulness as a distributed intelligence in our coaching conversations, not just as a thing we do to help people get centered before we start. It's not a tool. We can use it as a tool. We can use it as a form, uh, but then we're only using it in one way. We could use it as an intention to expand the quality of our conversations and to be more creative in our conversations and for the invention of new forms to come forward in our conversations. And these come through our interception, our ability to dig into the granite of ourselves and let the form reveal itself. This is the point where you might uh, want to just jot this bit down. Uh, you will have this, but you may need it for the practice that um, we're going to do in a minute. Now, this is not my work. This comes from a guy called Greg Kramer, who wrote a great book called Insight Dialogue. He's a Vipassana practitioner, not a Zen practitioner. I trained with him a few years ago for about a week. We spent the entire week doing uh, these steps over and over again. And what I like about this is that what Greg did was he, he produced a mindful dialogic approach, which coaches can use. So we don't often see coaches being taught this, but I think this is a really, really helpful way to connect this notion of mindfulness, taking it off the mat or off your personal chair and into relationship with our clients and into dialogue. And so um, here is the list. And I, what I'm going to do is I just want to speak a little bit uh, to each of those things. In fact, I'll, um, I'll do that by showing you how I came about it. Pause is of profound importance and massively undervalued in our societies particularly given how busy we are and how uh, hyper-regulated we are. 
the notion of pause almost invokes an existential crisis in some people. The absence of anything actually makes them jittery. We're not talking about silence here in the sense of leaving silence or space for the client to speak. We're talking about a suspension of narrative. So when you, when you get into mindfulness practice, actually this notion of pause is a very potent um, threshold that you set up in order to suspend thinking about what you're going to say next to suspend activity or to suspend building content. And the moment that you're able to be in that state of pause, you are already in a state of possibility. Possibility arises out of the ground of pause. So this is a very potent, fecund, um, juicy, overflowing place if you know how to be in pause. Uh, really, really well. The next thing that he talks about is this notion of relaxing. So we, we achieve a sense of genuine pause, not just quickly stopping, waiting for someone else to speak, but a genuine suspension um, of the mental, emotional and physical continuum, just enough to then intentionally relax. And I think this is incredibly important for coaches because so often we are working hard to add value in the conversation to our clients and working very, very hard to show that we're in support or that we're being quick or smart or whatever it might be, or just to find the, the line to follow that we actually don't often experience our work as relaxation. And when you, um, when you wire coaches up in their coaching sessions, which we do periodically, what you find is they are hyper-regulated themselves. They're just better at masking it. So we're really looking here for our coaching to be in a state of ease, um, suspension and then ease. And then when he talks about this idea of being open, I equate that to what we've been describing about, about not knowing, this idea of being open to what is in your head, in your emotional centres and in your physical body, not assuming you know because it's an easy thing for you to go for. And then listening deeply, listening deeply to the what I call the whole field, which is really listening with your entire intention attention to what is there inside you? What is there inside you? And he talks about this idea of, you know, trusting, trusting emergence. That is such a profound challenge in our society today. It's such a profound challenge in the way that we're made up, in the way that we work to be able to trust emergence if we fear that we aren't following the form. But here he's saying trusting emergence is the way to uncover things. Uh, I think it was Senge a few years ago in that absolutely outstanding book called Presence um, that I think was published in the early 90s, said vision cannot be manufactured. It has to be uncovered. And I think the best kind of coaching work is where the client is in a state of uncovering, is in a state of uncovering rather than manufacturing from a habitual state, just a slight iteration on what they would have already said if you hadn't been there. And then this notion of speaking your truth, which is unedited flow, unedited flow. And we, we have to pause on this because so much of the conversations that we engage in are edited and habitual, even if they fit the form of setting goals. So we are looking in this mindful dialogue to create, to dig a little deeper, to create a bit more opening, a bit more relaxation, to let the ground flower, really. And that's increasingly important. Now, I think it might be um, helpful to try this. And so I'm going to suggest to you, um, I've got three potential inquiries. You can pick one of these for ease or you might have one of your own. So I'm just going to show you what they are and then I'll, I'll come back to this slide. So I, I have three um, that you might want to think about. I'm not saying they're the right ones for you, but they're the ones I could come up with. 
So one inquiry uh, to use in this practice would be, how do I lose contact with myself, my own mental, emotional, physical continuum, or my own mindfulness when I'm working with my clients? How do I lose contact with myself? So that might be one inquiry you could pick. You might pick, um, what does the vow of not knowing free me to be as a coach? That might be another inquiry. And, and here's another one. What happens to me or my work um, or the relationship when I walk on the edge between being in my presence and aware of my anxiety? So I'm going to give you just a minute to think about an inquiry. You could take one of these, you can mash up one of these, or you can just intuit something that is more meaningful to you for this practice. So I'll just give you a minute to do that and I'll just flip the slide back up. So know that it's impossible to get this wrong. Uh, I genuinely mean that. Um, and all that you're required to do really is, is to have alighted upon an inquiry, something that's pertinent to you and to your work. So um, Carrie, I, I, you can probably see everybody. Um, you, can you just give us a show of hands if you've got an inquiry uh, that you can work with? Yeah, great, okay. Yeah, we're good to go. Great, thank you. So uh, I'll just walk you through this. So um, sit back, sit back. Just um, tell yourself that all you're going to do here is, is to notice. You're going to um, have choiceless awareness, choiceless awareness. And see if you can invite yourself to simply be in a state of pause, a state of choiceless awareness. We've done what we've done. Something else will happen. But for now, we're in a state of choiceless awareness or pause. And see when you invite yourself to do that, if you can just begin to notice what pause feels like to you. And let your body experience being relaxed. You, you only need to be using enough muscles to be able to keep you in the chair or wherever you're sitting. You don't need to be doing too much. So just do a quick check and see if there's any way that you can create more ease in your physical continuum so that you're only doing just enough physically to keep you where you are. We often overwork. And let your breath, your body experience ease. And invite yourself in whatever way feels comfortable to you to be willing to discover, to be willing to be altered, to be open to not knowing what will come. Inviting yourself in any way that feels comfortable to you to be willing to be altered by what you don't know will come. 
that, that relaxed feeling of just opening. And now if you would ask yourself your inquiry, the one that you picked, ask yourself your inquiry, read it out to yourself, speak it to yourself, let the language and the, and the energy of the inquiry really be with you. And as you do so, bring your attention back, listening deeply, seeing deeply, feeling deeply into the response that your body offers, into the response that your emotional centers offer, into the cognitive parts that may bring language or image. Just see what comes and really just trust emergence. Just trust it. Nothing to get wrong here. Notice any attempt on your part to edit or shape. Thank it and put it to one side. Intentional attention to what is emerging. Let the body, mind and emotional centers communicate And if you have things to write down, things to remember, things to note, please do so now. Thank you. Mindfulness to me is not a tool. Um, in our industrialized, commoditized world, we take depth practices and we reduce them to tools which we can access quickly and easily, which is a fabulous thing. But in the process of doing that, we squeeze out some of the spirit or the juice or the possibility in them in order to, to make them uh, more available and, and speedier. And I hear a lot from people about the fact that, you know, I think there's a phrase that's used over here. I don't know if it would be you're familiar with it. You're a human being, people say, not a human doing, as if somehow we've now polarised doing and being as if they're separate things and that we, it's more important to be than it is to do. But that structure, that way of speaking to people simply keeps them more fragmented. And I think we are an amalgam of being and knowing and doing or being and feeling and doing. And actually who we are is most definitely how we act. So mindfulness is a way to bring these disparate or polarizing activities, these separating, fragmented, atomized activities into relationship with each other more closely. And I think one of the most amazing things about our profession in today's world 
is that we are able to do that with people who don't often have that kind of conversation. And we can deepen it and anchor it and increase its efficacy if we can use our selves as a quality of presence and then um, create conversations which are beyond the forms that we have been given, that we can become formless once we know the form. Um, and this relationship between being and feeling, knowing and doing becomes, an, uh, they are linked and differentiated, but mindfulness enables us to bring them into dialogue with each other much more effectively. So yes, we use it as a tool. Yes, it's a self-care process. We can thank Kabat-Zinn for that in his uh, Full Catastrophe Living book, bringing all of that uh, marvellous work to our health and our well-being. And it's not just that. It's actually a ground of presence. It's, it's a way to be in dialogue, which opens up and gives us access to more of ourselves in a world that would have us edit ourselves down into bite-sized chunks that seem more easily swallowable and easy to sell. Carrie, I think I'm going to stop there. I think Hi, I'm gonna... Claire, there's some questions, and I think the first one I'll start with is, can you remind us the name of the, the author of the model you just walked us through? Yes, Greg Kramer. I'll put that in chat. Is it K-R-A-M-E-R? -E it is, yeah. And the book is called Insight Dialogue. Great, I'll put that in there too. Um, there were lots of questions. And so I'm gonna maybe start at the end and, and go backwards. Um, Mickey's curious if trusting is connected to that intuition. Yes, I think, I think there is a relationship because I think if we're in a state of distrust or inner editor sort of sanctioning out material that isn't welcome in our system or isn't welcome in our minds, I think actually we don't get into deeper states of gnosis um, uh, I don't know if that's a word that's familiar to some of you, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, meaning stuff we deeply know, but not necessarily at a cognitive level. And so I think when we're in a state of trusting our own mental, emotional and physical continuum, we are able to access more states of gnosis. And I think our industrial societies, our corporate environments, um, and even to some degree, the way we're trained as coaches actually limit our belief in those systems, you know, in a, in a, in a sort of they, they feel pre-modern, those kinds of ideas. And yet I think they're beginning to serve us well. And if you want more understanding of that, really, really go and have a look at the work that the Presencing Institute has done. That book Presence that Peter Senge wrote with Otto Sharma and Betty Sue Flowers was was for me a mind opening activity and they have gone on to do work in the presencing institute really really fantastic work at trusting trusting this deeper state of knowing to come forward we need that to solve the problems we have these days mm. claire would you say the easing part of that model is the pre-portion of hypnosis Ah, well, that's really interesting. Well, now I should tell you that literally on Friday, we are setting off an experiment on a retreat where we are teaching mindfulness based practices to people. And prior to it, they are having two sessions for each retreat of hypnosis in order to work on their unconscious belief systems about their ability to meditate. So your question is very timely to me. Um, and I think that being in states of ease down regulates our hyper regulation, shifts our autonomic nervous system and gives us more access to spacious creativity. So yeah, I would think that's probably right. Yeah. Excellent. It, I am curious. And so is Joan, when you were developing the grow model back in the, the mm. 80s and 90s, were you a Buddhist practitioner then? No. No, I wasn't, but I did have an interest in it. Um, but I would say that models arise out of the times we're facing. And you have to think that it, back at that period of time, you know, what we ended up with was, was, a, was a relationship between sports coaching and psychotherapy 
Yeah, that's what we we mashed up those two things. And what we really wanted to do was to produce something that had more orientation towards performance in the future, but nevertheless had some of the, the, the therapeutic relationship of two people working on something together. And so I think it was for its time. I do not believe, as useful as it is for, for certain things, that it's the only model. I think there are more dialogic models and more systemic models available to us now in the domain of presencing, which I think speak more to the complexity. I mean, when we started this, remember, computers, we were only just starting to use computers. People sent post in the UK and waited four days for a reply and still thought they were stressed. It was a different world. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about what you see the importance of somatic coaching? There's, there's so much work in that body right now. There is. And, and if you think about it, these things, um, the yogic traditions from thousands and thousands of years ago have known that work on the body liberates the mind and vice versa. Uh, we, we've, we've known this uh, from Bowen technique. We have, so we, what we now see as a somatic movement has really been, if you like, work that's come from many different strands coalescing into something which, which is now in the, in the domain and really tipped when, um, when Levine started to do work on, on post-traumatic stress disorder. And so um, that, and that work um, uh, had some mindfulness based influence in it because what we were saying was cognition is not as important as the truth of the body yeah the truth of the body and the and the experience of the body is is a wise place is a wise place that's a return to something we did thousands of years ago um, I'm going to ask one more question in chat, and then I'm going to invite Sarah and Shelley if they're willing to talk a little bit about their questions. Um, you were and I were talking about this, Claire, before the video started, which is being in person more effective than video. And so what would you say about that? Jeannie has a question. So does being in person, is it more effective than the video? Um, I have not found it to be so. In fact, since COVID started, um, I took a decision uh, not to work in person again. And so I am doing work with people who are dying. I'm doing work with the families of people who are dying. I'm working with chief executives. I'm working on virtual retreats around the world. I have not found, um, I've not found it uh, to be any less impactful. And I can still read and people can still feel empathic resonance because we're working at the quantum field and this stuff doesn't require people to be intimately face to face with each other for that to work. Of course, it's lovely to be in a room with other human beings, but it's absolutely possible to use these practices through this medium. As long as we remember that this medium is just another version of our own edited life and there's so much more beyond it. Yeah, that's good news. <laughs> um, Shelley, you put a question in chat about systems. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind coming off and saying a little bit more about that question. Yeah, so when you bring up awareness of systems, um, I, I love thinking about systems. I like thinking about the person as their own system and then they have the system outside. But when you are in this trying to get this mindful thing and you're trying to pay attention to all the systems that are impacting your client, how do you refrain from uh, not trying to coach those systems or somebody who's not in the room in a way that's you know going along with this mindful? I, I think using the model of pausing and ease would be great for me, but you know, with the client being understanding all their systems, kind of just trying to make sure I'm just coaching the individual themselves. I think it's really hard, isn't it? So I don't think there's an, I mean, it's a great question. There's no easy answer to this because I think what we're always trying to do is we're on the razor edge, aren't we, as coaches? We're, we're on the razor edge between love and power. We're on the razor edge between um, uh, opening and suggesting. We're on the razor edge between directing and, uh, you know, emerging. We're on lots of razor edges and this is just another one. What I think helps though is, is, is getting people to be more attentive on the amount of work or the amount of the system that is influencing them and becoming more aware of that. Not as an excuse for no accountability, but as a way of extending their awareness. And so what I tend to do is I get people to make maps. So you, you would be aware of constellation work, for example. I don't know if that's something you're familiar with. 
um, constellation work enables uh, you, your client, to make a little map, literally, of of relationships and dynamics, and also, um, and then I'm always asking, and what else might there be? Is there anything else on the edge that you don't normally pay attention to? So I'm just asking for them to expand their curiosity, really, and and I'm asking them to to determine how much they want to work on those influences or on those relationships, but to think about the unintended consequences of either doing so or not doing so. So I'm coming from a place of not knowing myself, really. I think that keeps me a bit more honest, to be, to be helpful to you. Beautiful question. Yeah, these I mean, are great like, questions. Mm. Sarah, you've had your hand up for a while, and I'd love to invite you into the room if you want to take yourself off mute. Okay, she might not be hearing, so we'll we'll move on. Is there any other question? Feel free to take yourself off mute. Guys, I think I had my hand raised earlier for, you know, having a topic, <laughs> but it is um, absolutely beautiful. And I'm just so grateful um, to be joining this conversation. Uh, I do believe truly that um, mindfulness practice really does open up so much um, of what we don't see. And so thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's... The for me, it's the call of our times to, um, you know, habitual mind creates habitual solutions, creates habitual activity, creates habitual fragmentation. And what we need is so much more now. We need so much more. And, that, and if, if it's only us, then we have to be able to access more of ourselves, particularly that which has been socialized out or that which feels like it doesn't normally fit into the structures we find in order to mine it for more insight, for more compassion and for more creativity, more resourcefulness. And it's within us. Uh, Gendlin, I think, proved that very, very well all those years ago, that our ability to shift and shape and move and change and lead is actually within our mental, emotional, and physical continuum. We just have to be able to, um, to get access to more of it. And habitual ways of talking and speaking do not deliver that. Thank you, Claire. I, when I heard you speak the first time, I, I just really felt so much not knowing emerging in me around this topic of mindfulness and how you invited me into a much larger space of making sense of something that has maybe been deconstructed down to a tool. Mm. So thank you. Um, a couple more questions real quick and then we will adjourn. Um, what were the three portions of the brain? Can you remind Jeannie of that again? Uh, yes, um, I can't right now. I'm having a middle aged moment. But if you look up resonant circuit, if you look up the resonant circuit, so you'll find that, that part of that is in the prefrontal cortex. There are two other parts. One of them is an emotionally regulating center. And what happens is this this interception practice, uh, which is simply simply noticing what's going on in you, literally strengthens the the connectivity between those three places. And what that enables us to do is the following. It enables us to increase our natural empathy or a natural empathic resonance towards others through doing it to ourselves first. It moves us towards moving towards problems rather than away from them. And it regulates our fight, flight, freeze response. So these are pro-social skills, yeah, pro-social skills. Joanne and then Hanukkah, if you guys would like to um, ask your question. Thank you. Um, this was fabulous, Claire. Thanks so much. Um, you, what you were just talking about are habitual ways of being for trying to sum up how eloquently you just spoke of all those habits that we, um, that we live in made me think around the notion of coaching as sort of a a disruptive force, if you will, particularly when you start thinking of living in a VUCA world, you know, a volatile, uncertain, uh, chaotic future and how coaching in, there's a polarity there, right? There's almost like a, a Zen cone about coaching, which can be so compassionate, yet so disruptive to the way we're thinking and mindfulness as that tool. 
I'm just, that's what it evoked for me when you were talking. And I'm just curious about your take on something like that. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I am totally with you. And in, an, in another time, we could easily spend another hour on exactly that issue because we spend a lot of time doing research into how certain people, particularly in organizations, were producing profoundly different results in the same large systems and organizations that other people were doing habitual results. And we did that research. We talked to 500 people worldwide. That's why we wrote two books. And what we realized was that in order to challenge the status quo of our own minds, as well as the systems that these minds have created, we need a challenger mindset. And one way to get that challenger mindset is to be quite strong in, in the compassionate disruption that we offer. And those of you that have ever been in a, in a Zen monastery or in a Zen so, uh, meditating will know, there is a stick, there is a stick in a monastery, um, which you can invite the person who's leading the meditation to gently tap you on the back. I don't mean whack you, tap you on the back. They call that the stick of compassion. I yeah. call it the wake up moment. We have plenty of things to wake up to and our industry has plenty of things to wake up to. So we need the stick of compassion on our own industry as much as on the work we're doing with our clients. Thank you. Hi, Claire. I'm Hanako. Um, I'm, it's not a question. This is just something that I wanted to share with you because you just gave me such a massive aha moment. Um, when you said that mindfulness is not is no longer a tool and because of the industrialized world we've kind of created these very convenient bite-sized chunks um i just had this conversation this morning about an espresso machine right like people just like to put the little pod in and make an espresso and i was like but i love making actual espresso like grinding the beans and everything and my friend was like why would you do that i'm like because i'm in the moment creating something sometimes it works out great sometimes my latte art looks like just slop, right? But it changes, like the, the outcome changes all the time, but I could still enjoy the process and the outcome. It still tastes wonderful. The look does not look great. But um, I, I feel like the conversation that you, you know, brought to us today, I, I feel like I have a little bit more like oomph and power to kind of like put myself in a situation and be like, this is the reason why I still read a book and not a Kindle, right? Mm -hmm. It's because like, the process of losing that human touch, I mm. think as much as convenience and for time's sake, which I think is fabulous, um, but the practice of mindfulness not being a tool anymore is something that I'm absolutely gonna take away with me. So thank you very much. Well, you're, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. And I, I should say, I love that story, by the way, I'm a coffee maker too. Um, I, I'm not anti-modernist. I'm really not anti the future. There's a thing in Buddhism called the near enemy, uh, which I find a really helpful concept. So uh, one of the things that um, uh, Zen practitioners get trained is this idea of equanimity, that you try to be um, balanced and equanimous. It, so you don't get rocked around by your client stories and activated by stuff. But the near enemy of that, in other words, it looks like you're being full of equanimity, but actually you've just numbed out. And so, uh, so we want to make sure that mindfulness doesn't become its own near enemy, yeah? that it just becomes a little thing, a little thing that you do and, and then it's done because we're missing, we're missing all of that. And it's that that enables us to be more creative. And it's that, I mean, I think coaching is an artistry as much as a science. And I think our bodies are an artistry and our creativity and our solution making processes are an artistry and they need full attention. Yeah, so keep making that coffee in the way that you make it. Claire, thank you so much for your time and I'm sure it's late in the UK. Maybe one last answer and then we will adjourn. Where can um, participants learn more about your work? Oh, um, how can they do that? So we we have a website um, for, our, for our business work, which is Reloom dot co dot uk r e l u m e reloom which means to reignite or, or refire comes from a fellow um uh, you can find me on linkedin claire genkai breeze g e n k a i um or you can email me uh, claire 
at reloom.co.uk. Very happy to always talk to anybody about anything. That's how we move things in the world. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. I put some of your, your brief information in chat. I, I think we'll find you. We will okay. let you down. Um, <laughs> I hope everybody has a lovely day. And um, thank you so much for bringing us just your insight and wisdom around mindfulness. Absolutely lovely to be with you all and uh, have very good lives, won't you? Take good care of yourselves. Bye-bye.